So today is really the core of this measurement theory of chaotic dynamical systems. Um, so before, the right, last couple lectures, first we looked at how dynamical systems map distributions forward rather than how they map points forward in an orbit. We looked at how they map distributions forward. Kind of familiarize ourselves with some notions from probability theory. And then we sort of shifted last lecture to talk about stochastic processes, but over discrete symbols, typically the examples which is binary. So, so this lecture and the next one are going to knit these two things together. And the main goal is to realize that, and it's almost unique to chaotic systems, the very fact of chaos means that you can use very imprecise measurements to track their state, internal state. So it's a little surprising, but it's a key idea. and. Um, kind of an interesting, challenging one. So, so that's the goal um, for uh, today, and we'll see how much we need to finish up on uh, next Tuesday. So again, we're sort of marching across this learning channel. Again, the box, I guess today, is going to be completely closed. We don't get to stick our head. Well, we have to understand what how internal mechanisms work with discretization. But we're pretty much closing up the box now. So again, just to maybe present the, the, the questions before us today, we imagine that there's some dynamical system, continuous state, continuous time system here. And then uh, we, our access to that, as observers, our access to this, the real states of nature and the actual dynamic is mediated by instruments. So here's kind of a cartoon picture of what an instrument is. First of all, you make some choice as to the number of probes you put into your system. I mean, you might imagine you were looking at some turbulent fluid, and you'd have the question, oh, how many probes should I put in to the fluid, the spatial extended system, such that I capture the dynamics? So that's a choice you make. And then based on the number of, of, of probes that you put in, imagine these are scalar. You're measuring a temperature, or a wind velocity, or a chemical gradient. These are scalar numbers. That choice is a projection from the high dimensional states down to some lower dimensional subspace of the system. You know, there's even the issue, did I pick the right thing? Right? If I'm looking at turbulent fluid and I have my number of loaves of bread produced meter, that's not relevant, right? So you have to make the right choice and observable. Um, there's an art to that that is usually told to you by the discipline you're working in, what you should measure, what the relevant observables are. And then in addition, um, instruments have finite precision. It's particularly true today, where we have, where everything gets mapped into the digital domain. We have these devices called analog to digital converters, and they all come with a certain resolution. And you've probably seen this on your CD players or, or, or other ways you have of uh, audio processing. There'll be 16 bit sound, or 24 bit sound, or 48 bit sound, which is super. <clears throat> high resolution for audio recording. That finite resolution breaks each one of the observables, these scalar probes you have, into some number of discrete bins. So I'm just showing that here's this grid now. Uh, I'll use epsilon to be the resolution, the induced resolution, due to how many, uh, uh, how accurate the analog to digital converter is. So, what, so what you as an observer, what do you do? You go into the lab and you ask your instrument to give you a measurement. So what does that mean? Well, in this picture, it's pretty straightforward. At some moment in time, you're asking the instrument to return, basically, the label of the cell in which the instrument finds the state of this dynamical system. So the state of the dynamic system is projected to this low dimensional space. You say, oh, you think you're measuring volts. In fact, what is returning? is a number that's essentially just a label for this cell. And then we can uh, we have a finite number of these cells. And so we have a finite alphabet. And let me just sort of code those into some binary number. And as I ask for a series of measurements, I'm getting a time series out. So implicit in this is you know, arguing basically all we really have to study some sense is just binary strings coming out. Do this mapping down to a discrete set of cells and then encoding the labels for those cells in binary numbers. 
so, yeah. What's the D superscript on this one? D, that's, that's the uh, number of probes we have. So take that as the dimension. So here D would be two in my drawing. Could be three or four. Um, uh, it's, it's a question. What, what is D for a video camera? Well, I was just talking about recording this lecture in 1080p. Well, that's actually a square grid of 1920 pixels across and 1,080 lines. So I won't do the product, but that's large. That's over a million pixels. And then colors, exact, very good, right. And then times three, because we have colors, or that's what they tell you they're doing in there. In fact, the, the camcorder manufacturers, they mess around a lot with color, how they record. So that large number, <laughs> that would be D. <laughs> so maybe you'd think, oh, that's not, you know, that should be a pretty good representation of what's going on. If I had, well, in fact, I guess we did this, right? We recorded the lecture wasn't 1080p, but it was a you know, CCD-based camera, discrete camera. We recorded the, the pendulum. And that, we argued, was just a four-dimensional system. So you would sort of imagine that a video image of that, which is this projection now, that's huge dimensional space, a million dimensions, is overkill. Right? You know, what I would really do if I wanted accurate measurements of that chaotic pendulum I would probably just instrument the, the, the pivot and look at the, the angle. And then that scalar time series would come up, then I would numerically take the derivative to get the velocity and kind of pull the coordinates out that way. <clears throat> For a turbulent fluid, you'd really love to have all of the volume elements, the velocity and all of the volume elements of the three-dimensional fluid track, but that's, we, we have no such camera. That's just too much data. So this, this it's kind of typical, I would say, unless we're using a video camera to look at the driven the, the, the chaotic pendulum. Typical that you're you're throwing information away, and that's sort of the challenge. In fact, I'm arguing here. In fact, you probably should object seriously that all we have to study are binary strings. But that's kind of the argument. This brings up a number of questions. Is a binary representation of a continuous system faithful in any sense whatsoever. So today I'm going to argue through this area of dynamical system called symbolic dynamics that in fact, remarkably, it works extremely well. Particularly because the system is unstable and chaotic. So that's kind of the fun puzzle in all of this. <clears throat> okay, so, so that's the challenge. What can we learn from this discrete time series? You don't really have to do binary. You maybe have a a you know, larger complement, that would be fine. So the technical side of symbolic dynamics is parallels what we've been doing so far, right? So far we've been talking about, when I said we were studying dynamical systems, we are talking about a map or a flow that takes a current state to the next state. Where I was evolving a zero-dimensional point forward in time. Last week we talked about how to extend that to think about the dynamical system or map pushing an initial probability distribution forward. That's a different kind of object. And there's sort of a strategy here. One way of understanding systems, say formally or mathematically, is to understand how this transformation moves objects, different kinds of objects around. So we study points, zero-dimensional points, and distributions. And today, we develop this parallel, we're going to study how the dynamical system moves cell boundaries forward. And we're going to ask, are there good ways to discretize, to, to put cells onto a continuous state space? And there'll be specific conditions that will tell us that even if it's a very coarse partitioning, even binary, that the resulting 0-1 sequence basically tells us almost everything we want to know about the original dynamical system, even though it's continuous state space, which is bizarre. I, going from continuous, what you might think is infinitely precise points, down to just a binary measurement. How in the world could that capture the behavior. So there's a certain amount of um, um, definitional nesting we have to do to get started. Notation, it's a little bit notation heavy. So what I want to do is, and this is a little bit different from how I usually present the, the new ideas we were doing in the lectures. I'll, I'm going to sort of 
talk through the main construction qualitatively. Then I hope that by example. And then I'll introduce a notation. And then we'll come back to this example again. Hopefully that'll kind of bracket the, the mathematical ideas. Okay, so let's just think about a one-dimensional map. And here's our favorite logistic map. So f of x here. There's the state space 0 to 1. And I'm, the, you know, the green function tells you how you map the current state to the next state. So the uh, domain of x, the range of f. Um, and what I'm going to do is propose to just measure the current state, say x sub 0, on the interval with a binary measuring instrument. And this measuring instrument is going to do a very simple thing. If the state is here, the instrument is going to return, in particular I mean between 0 and a half, the instrument is going to return to 0. And that just says you're in the left half of the interval. And if the state was greater than a half and less than 1, this instrument is going to say, oh, 1. Obviously, at one time step, I just threw away an infinite amount of information. I have some information, to, but it's just left right of this, this point, what I call D here, this decision point. It's a threshold for whether the instrument reports 0 or 1. OK, so now what I'm going to do is ask, when I'm using this instrument, if I see Two, two symbols in a row, two binary symbols in a row. What does that tell me about where the system could have started? What set of initial conditions could have produced length two sequences? So I've kind of drawn out here a construction. This is like the key construction here. We'll do this three different ways, so this is just the first pass. So, so imagine that I told you you had this logistic map here, and the instrument is has this decision point D at a half. And then I tell you zero, zero. The question is, what set of initial conditions x0 would produce 0, 0? Okay. Well, the first symbol was a 0. Therefore, I know it started in the left half. But then it produced a 0. So let's just now look at this. If, I, if, if the initial x0 is close down here, I see that it starts in the 0 half. And then under one iteration, it also maps to a half. In fact, this interval here for x1 starts at where this maps over to in the, the range of f 0 to a half. And therefore, the next time step, the instrument is going to also report a 0. Whereas if I said, oh, we saw a 0, 1, that meant it started in the left half. But to produce a 1 on the next iteration, it was in this subinterval between this dividing point here and a half. And notice how that maps above d and therefore the instrument the next time will report a 1. So, and so on. So if you saw 1, 1, that means it started on the right half. And then there's a sub-piece of that that on the next iteration, it maps up to 1. So you take 1, 0. It started up here on 1. And then this piece up here maps to a 0. So what are we doing? So I, this, this, is, this is a procedure by which we're specifying an initial condition on the interval. And this instrument, over time, is returning a binary code. And the question is, are these binary codes related to the internal dynamics? So here's the kind of uh, argument by induction, almost. So now let's think about length three sequences. So I can go through the same. I can talk through the same argument before. Oh, well, you saw 0, 0, 0. Well, it was 0, it was 0, and it was 0, right? Which intervals? So it's just this little piece down here. So the couple things to say about this. First of all, notice, just kind of glancing over this construction, when I went to length 3 sequences, the subintervals corresponding to these codes all got smaller. So there's a notion of a faithful encoding such that as I look at longer and longer sequences, the intervals of initial conditions that are associated with those get smaller and smaller and smaller. So that in the mathematical limit of infinite length codes, the ideal would be that you label individual initial conditions. And then you'd say, oh, well, I can, I can study the map on the interval, whether the real value is x, or I could study these binary strings. 
because this ends up making, when it's a faithful encoding, it's a mapping between the two representations. I have x0, x1, x2, I have this set of real numbers, or I have this, I will argue, much simpler representation that's essentially equivalent of a binary string. So that's the main idea. Right, so I give you a dynamical system, there's some question. In this case, I, I knew what the answer was for a good partition, such that I could get a faithful code. And as I looked at longer and longer binary sequences, I would specify smaller and smaller subintervals of the unit interval. Now, this cartoon here has a lot more information. In particular, I'm sort of showing you, kind of running the argument I was making for how we got these codes backwards. The way we figure out where these dividing points are is we look at this decision point up in the range of f. And then we look at, say, if you want to look at um, length two sequences. I look at those points that map to d. Or the other way to say this is that I look at d and I look at f inverse of d. The so-called inverse images. Those x values in the range that map to d, the decision point in the, sorry, x values in the domain that map to the decision point in the range of f. That's this construction here. And if I go to longer sequences, then I look at the inverse <coughs> images of a half, or d, under f squared, and so on. So there's actually a fairly constructive procedure of figuring out where these partition boundaries should be. I look at higher iterates of f as I go to longer sequences, and then I look at the, the inverse images, all those points in the domain that map to d in the range of that iterate. Then I take all of those, the inverse images of, of d under f, under f squared, under f cubed, and intersect them, and that will give me this set of dividers that I was just sort of arguing. Okay, so that's the construction in words. So now I'll introduce some of the, the terminology, partly because we would like to think about this concept in higher dimensional systems. Right? So this is it's nice and straightforward to show. That was largely sort of worked out in the one dimensional case in detail. And then but we'd like to do this for higher dimensional systems too. Okay, so now some some of the notation and some of the ideas behind this. Okay, so what we're doing is we're starting with some dynamical system. I'll call the dynamic f and the state space m. And uh, we have our f is this mapping from states to states, previous states to next states. Okay. We're essentially changing the representation of the systems. The goal is to come up with something, and actually another dynamical system, it's called a symbolic dynamical system, that as much as possible captures everything that's going on under iterates of f, on the original system. And the benefits of this we'll, we'll come to later on. In fact, the whole rest of the course sort of depends on being able to do this. It turns out these discrete partitions of a continuous state space allows us to calculate properties of a continuous system that we couldn't otherwise calculate. As long as we have a faithful uh, uh, encoding. Okay, so first concept, partitioning. So the first thing we're going to do is take the state space and break it into the cells. So these cells, I'll just label P sub I. They're subsets of the state space, and they form a partition, which means by union them up, they cover the entire state space, and they don't overlap. They don't intersect each other. So it's a complete uh, covering of the state space. Um, we also have to, and there are many partitions of a state space, so that's a little bit going to be a design issue for us, which to pick. But anyway, this is a partition. Uh, we also have to think about, as you kind of saw before, imagine we had two different partitions of the state space. Together, how do they identify cells? So that's called the refinement of two different partitions, P and Q. Let's denote this wedge here, upside down wedge. And it's simply the set of all of the intersections. So I might have P has uh, three cells, Q has four cells. I'll do all intersections of those. And you were seeing that before as we went to longer lengths. That's actually how those uh, divider, partition dividers that were inverse iterates of D at different uh, length sequences would be put together to find out 
intervals and initial conditions are produced in the same code. And you can, it's a good exercise, but you can also show that a refinement is also a partition that satisfies this. Oh, straightforward exercise. Uh, okay, so we have this partition, and think of this, I just made a choice of measuring instrument. You know, it could be the Hewlett Packard 1020 analog to digital converter, something like that. You make a choice. Most analog to digital converters do a very simple partitioning. Uniform cells. Usually you put in uh, volts. It's a typical observable in, in a, in, for uh, analog to digital converter. And the voltage, maybe the thing will accept uh, plus or minus 10 volts. And you have a 16-bit converter. It's going to break that into uniformly spaced cells uniformly sized cells, <coughs> basically have size 1 over 65,536. Okay, but that'd be a 16-bit uniform partition. Um, so we, we want to sort of move from the partitions themselves, which are subsets of the state space, to the label. There's some symbol attached to that. And actually, at this point, the choice of symbol is also a bit arbitrary. Um, you know, it could be heads, tails, could be zero ones, could be A, B, C, D. They're just indices. So uh, we're actually throwing away you know, the cells on the, in, on the unit interval I just showed you actually had some relationship to each other. But right now, we just kind of have labels, and we can choose what, what, what that alphabet is. <clears throat> so we now have this measurement operator, which was what I was just illustrating. If I have a current state, what partition element is that associated with, and then I return the label of that partition element, 0, 1, A, B, C. So pi, just plug in the number on the interval, and this returns 0, 1, from the example we just did. Now, the important thing is, in the original dynamical system, we had these orbits, some initial condition, and then a series of iterates. And now we have a corresponding measurement sequence. Namely, for each one of the states on the interval, I return to symbol 0 and 1. So there's this mapping from, think of it as a semi-infinite string of iterates on the interval or states in the trajectory down to a semi-infinite binary string, the encoding of this. And we denote that also with pi. Just can extend that definition to be component-wise. Okay, so we go from orbit to string. And the issue is how much information in this measurement sequence is, tells us something about the original orbits here. What properties can we calculate from S that are properties of the orbit X? So there's this issue of faithfulness we'll now sort of move to. So again, we have this orbit space, which is just the state space cross itself. Right? And it was the one-dimensional map. You just have the unit interval across the unit interval across the unit interval. And the other space uh, we're working with is the space of sequences, which is the alphabet cross the alphabet cross the alphabet. So if the alphabet's binary, sigma here is just the space of all binary strings. In the case of one-dimensional maps, we're thinking of semi-infinite, uh, two-dimensional maps, and so on. We'll often think of bi-infinite strings and bi-infinite orbits. Okay. So now I'm setting up here. We're trying to figure out what kind of dynamical system do we have over these simple sequences. So I'm just talking about the state space of the system. Remember, so in the original dynamical system, we had f mapping the state space to itself over one time. We extend that to think about the behaviors over all time, so dealing with this space up here. Now, what's the dynamic over this space of sequences? So I'm going to call that the shift operator. You can see why the name shift. But it's an operator that takes the current sequence to a new sequence, a new state in this space, if you like, but it's a sequence. And the way it works is that the ith symbol in the new sequence is just a previous symbol in the original sequence. So I have this now binary sequence, and I iterate it with this, in this symbolic dynamical system. I just shifted time by one. That's all that happened. 
but there's also a shift up here. Now that I'm looking at the entire trajectory in the, in the, in the state space, in the orbit space, I can shift time, just takes my time index and adds one to it. So, um, that might seem kind of trivial, but that's exactly the point of this construction. Before, we had some quadratic function, or we know some trigonometric function, some god awful thing. Could be, you know, Newton's laws of gravitation for the free body problem. Complicated f over continuous state space. But what I've just done is move to another representation, a symbolic representation, where I have this, first of all, set of allowed states, the, 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 the binary sequences we can see, but the dynamic is trivial. So what that means is that all the complicatedness, nonlinear, continuous, difficult things we had to do with f, we might want to do with f, have been translated and kind of recoded into the structure of the space of sequences. So this is, this is sort of the huge win of doing symbolic dynamics. OK, a um, little more yeah, terminology, and then we'll finish defining this thing we've just created. So we have admissible sequences, just like there are certain orbits that a system will produce, and there are other orbits which it won't produce. Uh, we have the corresponding notion, the symbolic representation of the admissible sequences. Which binary sequences do we see as the system is iterating along? Which binary sequences come out? Um, so we have you know, the space of all possible sequences here. Think of the space of all possible binary strings. For a given dynamical system, we're not going to see all of those. So I'm going to kind of denote the subset of, of observed sequences as sigma sub f. And that's a subset of what could happen in the whole space of sequences. Now, if we have the initial condition that's going to lead to an orbit, if that's on an invariant set in the original dynamical system, then this set here is also an invariant set under the shift. It's kind of nice that topological properties map over. We hope in this encoding, whatever it is, that we preserve at least the coarsest properties. If I'm on some attractor that's invariant under over time, I'd like the corresponding set of sequences that states on that invariant set can produce to also be now shift invariant in the in symbolic representation. So we have a notion of invariant sets here too. And invariant sets under the shift operator correspond through the encoding scheme to invariant sets under the original F that dynamic. So that's it. So this, this is this construction. It's called a symbolic dynamical system. We have a state space, the admissible sequences, and we have this shift operator, which is just trivial. It just, it, it just increments time. So in fact, in most of the analysis we do, we kind of forget <laughs> that we're shifting in time, what the, what the mapping is over this dynamical system. We mostly just have questions about how the space of uh, sequences is structured, which the sequences are allowed, which are disallowed, and so on. What, which quantitative properties are captured by the the structure of this shift space. Um, okay, so to, to answer that kind of question, right, we, I have a choice here which partitions I could use. I could use a really stupid partition, right? Here's the attractor in the state space, and I make my decision point over here, and therefore I get all zeros out the whole time. Obviously, as a choice of instrument, that's not correct. <laughs> Right? It's not, it's throwing, that instrument is throwing everything away. The system's behaving over here, and I'm looking over here. Right? So, so we need some criteria that let us evaluate a candidate instrument or partitioning to see if it gives a faithful encoding, if the output discrete sequences are a faithful encoding of the continuous orbits. Okay, so first thing we need to think about is what's called a projection operator. Um, the name projection is just, we're talking about this mapping between orbits over the continuous state space and symbol sequences. So um, here, the way uh, it's set up, we're thinking of actually this projection operator delta is we plug in an infinite sequence and it returns the subset of the state space, that set of initial conditions that could have produced that sequence. 
Right? That was the first exercise when we were going through the construction for the logistic map. So we saw zero, zero, zero. What set? Well, was that set down close to the origin? And that's what delta returns. So it kind of encapsulates that whole construction. You just need some function. I can plug in a sequence and tell me, okay, what subspace in the of initial conditions could have produced that sequence? And then the way this is done, so I said it in words now twice. This projection operator is the refinement of the inverse images of the partition elements. So this, in a very compact way, this is what I said in terms of looking at it the inverse images of a half. There I'm just tracking the decision points. Here I'm actually working on the sets and how they intersect with each other when I do the refinement. Right? So we have a series of, uh, of refinements here, and then I look at the inverse image of those under the map, and then intersect all of those, and then that's going to be the sub that produced that sequence. Okay. So, uh, kind of a as a consequence of that, uh, we can talk about if we've seen a given word of length L, what set of initial conditions could have produced that? So, and there's a kind of an interpretation back in, this, in, the, in the original orbit space that's helpful to get some idea what the projection operator is doing. So, when I specify a particular length L sequence, could be 10111. What does that correspond to back in the orbit space? Well, it turns out that corresponds to orbits that sort of followed each other for a while in the sense that they hop from together in coordination, they hop to the same series of partition elements. Then maybe later on they spread out. But at least for that period of time, I saw 10111. The visitation in the cells was the same. So when we talk about a sequence, what you should think about is the cylinder of orbits that all sort of track each other for a while. So that's this notion of L cylinder. Now, the, the name cylinder comes from thinking about the structure in the orbit space, but what, 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 what the L cylinder is, is the set. It's actually a, a subset of the space of infinite sequences, those that share the symbols in the length L word. So, so this object here is, if I specify a length 3 word, 101, what I'm imagining when I talk about the L cylinder associated with the sequence 101, it's the set of all infinite sequences that have that sequence in it somewhere. So it's a subset of this. Like for every L, it's a partition of this. That's the exercise. Okay. So again, this is just another way of thinking about how the, the discrete sequences could possibly encode useful information about the original continuous dynamical system. It's, it's, for one thing, these L cylinders, the words that you see, the sequence you see, are actually encoding orbits that track each other for a while. So as I said, this is, in fact, if I look at the L cylinders, not only are the L cylinders, the set of eight sequences, a partition of the space of admissible sequences, by name's infinite sequences, when I take each one of those L cylinders and project it back into the state space, you also get a partition of the original state space M. And that's sort of important, covering all the state space. In fact, what I should say is that these are admissible sequences. We're just looking at a partition of the invariant set in the original dynamical system. And again, you, know, you can think about, if you kind of imagine fixing a partition, and then kind of formally I take that partition and Look at its inverse iterates, just like we looked at the inverse iterates of a half, second inverse iterates of a half, and so on. Refine all those things together, then we get this refined partition of the state space, that the original dynamical system. And this guy here is an element of that piece of the state space. Okay. So this is the symbolic dynamics of it dynamical system. Just to kind of summarize what we've done here, and then we'll come back to the example, just to kind of ground it. Um, we have possibly some very complicated one-step mapping, or the equations of motion, F. Now, we've moved 
to this hopefully faithful symbolic representation. We don't even really much care about the dynamic anymore because it's so trivial, it just shifts time. So instead of an infinite precise point in the original state space, we deal with an infinite binary sequence in the space of admissible sequences. For the system. Um, and the, this criteria for when the encoding is faithful or the partition is good, what we want is uh, basically to recover these properties, right? So we want to be able to study this discrete sequence to calculate the various properties of the con original continuous system. And because it, we're dealing with discrete sequences, there are a number of techniques, which we're going to borrow from information theory, which is well developed and in some ways much easier to use for continuous information, I mean for, for um, discrete information sources. So we can often calculate quantities directly. And in fact, there's a long history in this construction. When we talked about Poincaré and the three-body problem, probably the first and second lecture, he sort of showed analytically and topologically that the three-body problem, sun, earth, and a massless moon constrained to evolve in a plane, that had these very complicated orbit sets. It was the first demonstration that could be chaotic behavior. But after a while, people were studying this, and they wanted to be more quantitative about it. So I have, here's one system. Okay, I've got four planets now. Is that more or less chaotic than this one? They wanted to be more quantitative. And the first method that people developed to measure how chaotic systems were, were disc discretizing the state space and showing them how to faithful encoding. So the symbolic dynamics was, was in the 1920s. So Poincaré was the 1890s. It took about 30 years to come up with this technique to actually be quantitative about how chaotic the system was. It was right about the same time the Oppenheim introduced the Oppenheim exponents. And there's an interesting relationship between these two quantities. Okay. okay, so now back to an example. So uh, kind of interpolating the first uh, narrative example and a notation just said, let's just think about one-dimensional maps. So again, we have F mapping the interval to itself. Uh, and we're going to just talk about F with two monotone pieces, like the logistic map or 10 map. And uh, we'll have a binary partition. So one bit instrument that returns a zero if x is below d and one if x is above d. Okay, so in the d I call the decision point. It's, it's a number on the interval. And uh, like we talked through, the, the L cylinder induced partition on the state space is specified by these cell boundaries, partition cell boundaries, d, a half, the two inverse uh, iterates of a half inverse inverse of f squared and a half, and so on, where the decision point is. And we can even assign a code to this. Right? So I have, think of x as an initial condition. It iterates. I generate some, some uh, symbol sequence. And then I can, from these iterates, get the symbols, individual symbols out of that. I just see which partition is. And then, like we did before when we were looking at binary sequences, um, we just weight the um, most significant bit in the sequence, one half, one quarter, one so on, in successive digits, to get a real number in the unit interval. Okay, so let's go back to this example and see if this makes some more sense. Uh, okay, logistic map again, but any two lap map, basically this construction will work for, so it could be the tent map, shift map, any map with two monotone pieces. So I say, let's Use this binary instrument. Return zero for x less than d and one greater than d. Then we'll look at length two sequences and to figure out what the partition boundaries are, I take d and look at the first and second inverse iterates of f of d under f, and that breaks the original two-segment partition of the interval into a four segment partition, four partition cells here. Um, one thing you notice, if, if I were to think of these binary codes as binary numbers, zero, one, two, three, as I move x across the interval, I don't have a monotonic code. And I jump from zero, one, to three, to two. So actually, that sequence is telling something about, in this case, that we have a negative slope over 
So there's actually some information encoded in how we look at this, that phi mapping, the metrizing. And then, again, so finally, for the like three sequences, we have a refined partition. Again, the important thing is that all these partition elements are shrinking. So here's the, the, the kind of interesting puzzle. Because the system is chaotic, it's expanding in forward time, which means in reverse time it's contracting. Right? And calculating the partition dividers, essentially determining the size of the refined partition cells by looking at the inverse images of D, the decision point. The very fact that this is expanding in forward time means that, that this calculation going in reverse time the cells are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I mean, there are different ways to see this. Like, it's possible to over-explain this construction, but that's another interpretation of what's going on here. It's because the system is chaotic <laughs> that these encodings can be good. Slightly strange. Right? Because the system is unpredictable and chaotic and has complicated orbit sets, I can actually use very simple encodings, or encodings over simple alphabets, to capture their properties. It's very handy, that's what we see. Yeah? So we, is, is there a requirement that our, um, as our symbols, our states have to evolve at the same time? You, oh, so yeah, that's... right. Well, you might be throwing some information away, yeah, right. Yeah. But this is all so far. Yes, lockstep. Step. Right. Well, then, so what are you studying if you just if you just looked at the measuring the measurement symbol every ten steps? What well, it would be, say, you don't have a box, you have no idea what the step is. Well, so in the case of the one D map, you'd be looking at f to the ten. You have a new dynamical system, right. and you're sort of stroboscopically looking at it over a longer period of time. And so that would correspond, in this case, to f to the ten. Yeah. So just emphasize this point about uh, faithfulness of the encoding. So, so we have this question, when are these partitions good? At this point, it's been kind of a, a, our choice which partition we take. The examples I gave you were happened to be good, um, but you could choose D to be some other value than a half for the logistic map. And it's an interesting question. What, if anything, the binary sequences coming out tell you? Or maybe, in fact, a bad partition has actually added something to the system. It appears to be more st structured or more chaotic. So is that possible? So, OK, so the goal here is we want, we, we need to be more precise about what this, this um, criterion of goodness is for partitions. We want the symbol sequences to encode the orbits. And hopefully, that would be one to one, uh, the mapping between. So, so diagrammatically, we have this transformation of the state space to itself. That's the original dynamical system. And now we've constructed these various functions, formally, projection operator. So we have the system that's iterating the continuous states repeatedly. And what we've constructed is this so-called commutating diagram where, oh, I've got an x value, current state. I can look at the orbit that generates and then find the uh, uh, corresponding uh, sequence in the space of binary sequences, say. I do the trivial shift dynamic. I get a new sequence with basically the time origin binary point to shift it over one. And then using this projection operator, and this is why it's called a projection operator, it's this particular link, I can look up what state that new sequence corresponded to. So at the most general level, we want this diagram to commute that either I can operate the dynamic on the state space, or I can go through this other path of state to corresponding infinite sequence, shift it trivially, and then look back up with that new sequence, what state that corresponds to. Or this. In other words, the action of the dynamic on the original state space is equivalent to this. Go from state look up the sequence, shift the sequence trivially, and then map that sequence back onto a state in, in M. Um, does this, the diagram commutes, does that require that 
Um, no, it's okay. So, I mean, in the case where we have right. a, a map T that's many to one. Right, like the logistic map is an example. Yeah, sure, yeah. yeah, yeah logistic, right? Two right, the, the two things can go yeah. like this, right. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, in that case, what, wait, did the projection operator not be a little bit? Oh, okay. Yeah, sigma is always going to be bijective, right? Okay, right. Yeah. So, this isn't necessarily delta. Yeah, it's not. This, okay, this is where it goes. Yeah. This, remember, in fact, just as we were calculating for the logistic map, f of d, we had multiple right. pre-images of that. So that's where we're sort of, that's where the information is being maintained about the possible non-invertibility of t. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, now there are certain things where we're sort of throwing away with this. This is what you would call a very topological view. We're just sort of tracking orbits. So, for example, just to kind of give a hint of this, um, there is. Uh, you know, the tent map is different from a logistic map because there's some curvature there. This really doesn't distinguish between the curving or piecewise linearity of those two maps. So there is some information on the interval we're throwing away. But for some quantities, and the question will be what, uh, that you can calculate this way. Like, for example, how much information is produced per unit time. The metric entropy, or entropy rate, that I already introduced and said we would get back to. So this is one of the things we can still calculate. Using the simple sequences and sometimes very straightforward. Okay, so so um, but we're presented with this problem, design problem. I've got a system. I want to discretize it somehow. Uh, what's the best way to do that such that the encoding is faithful? So there are two classes of partition. Um, one very nice called the Markov partition that should kind of sound familiar. What this is going to do is actually induce a Markov chain on the system, and we know how to calculate everything for Markov chains. Uh, and then generating our partitions, which are a little less demanding, in some sense easier to find. Um, um, and a little harder to work with, but interesting in capturing pretty much everything still. Okay. So let's talk first about Markov partitions. So now um, we're just going to think about a sequence space. Um, and the idea here is that a Markov partition induces symbol sequences that can be described by a Markov chain. So remember what a Markov chain was? We had general Markov processes, but Markov chain, discrete symbol. The Markovian property is that the future only depends on the previous symbol. Right? There's only a one-step history dependence. And obviously, if we can find these, that's great because it's going to be, I guess, a more compact model. So how are we going to do this? This is kind of the, we want the, we put this discretization down on the continuous state space, and we have this discrete set of symbols coming out, and we like that stochastic process to be one of these simple Markov chains. So now the question is, take that property back to the original continuous state space. Let's see if we can come up with some criteria for that. So again, we'll just the constructions are just easier uh, for maps of the interval. Um, We'll have some partition, some number of elements, some some alphabet size, uh, and then basically rather than thinking of the intervals themselves, we'll just think about the, the, the boundaries, the decision points between them. Okay. But still, this has to be these cells have to be a partition of the state space, cover the whole space and not overlap. Okay, <clears throat> so so here's here's the definition, and we'll have to see how it works. So we say this choice of a partition in the space is a Markov partition to some function f. When I apply f to the whole set, I didn't think of the boundaries, but to the whole set, and the resulting set in the range of f is exactly the union of other partition elements. Examples will come, so that's the definition. Okay. Moreover, that f restricted to each cell is basically a monotone function, one-to-one -one monotone. So here's an example, just to kind of drive this home. So here, I'm kind of dropping off some of the notation. So here's the domain of f, the range of f. is f in green here. And I made just a real simple example where we have four partition elements. You know, they don't overlap. Their union is the full interval. And here is f. So now, 
the first criteria was I take F and apply it to this first cell, and that maps to P1, P2, and P3. Exactly. P2 maps to P3, P3 maps to P3 and P4, and P4 maps actually to the whole of them. Exactly. So I just wrote that out here. The F of P1, F of P1, is the union of P1, P2, and P3, and so on. So that's the first step. And then you also have to go here and say, ah, basically I have, within the cell, I have a one-to-one -one mapping, restricted to the cell. So F, restricted to the cell, is some other one. It can't wiggle inside here. Well, it can't wiggle too bad. It can't, for example, turn around and so on. By way of contrast, here's an example, it's slightly different, that is not a Markov partition. Why? Well, okay, P1 is still fine, but the problem is P2 maps to just part of P3, right? So F of P2 isn't some exact union of the others. Same thing with P3. P3, although it spreads all over P4, only captures part of P3. So no good. And the claim is that these will be bad encodings of some initial condition iterated under that map, that you're throwing some information away. So Markovian is somehow the state space coarse grain really does look like kind of a Markov chain. It's discrete states that are mapping into each other cleanly. So in uh, this particular case, if you go through and kind of summarize this, uh, you can write down uh, label, sorry, a directed graph like this. Like, let's see, uh, P2 went to itself, and P1 went to itself, P2 and P3. So I have transitions like that. Uh, P4 went to itself, P3, P2, and P1 over the whole interval, and so on. So I just sort of summarize the sort of uh, state being in one of the intervals, is just a blob here, as if it was a Markov chain state and then wrote down all the possible transitions. So we won't prove this, but if you have, if you satisfy those, you have a partition that satisfies those criteria, then you can show that the longer the sequences are in this encoding, the smaller and smaller the interval of initial conditions. And therefore, in the limit, you have this nice mapping between the encoded sequences and the original orbits. Now, there's a little bit of ambiguity so I don't want to go into too many technical details. Um, for example, um, when you choose states arbitrarily close to the partition boundaries, there can be some ambiguities that are sort of like, well, we have, think of real numbers. If I tell you the number one, you have a, an idea in your head. In fact, when I write down a binary or decimal expansion of that, I have two names, two encodings for the number one. 1. 1.000000. Or 0 0.99999. Right? So I change representation and there's a little bit, it's, this isn't too bad, right? It's, I just have two. So there, there are some encoding ambiguities like that, but those are sort of finite to one and we're not going to worry about them for most of the quantitative properties that we're going to capture. This kind of diagram here, the properties we calculate from it will capture sort of the sort of statistically sort of robust properties of the system. Okay. And again, yeah. show that Markov partition satisfied this property. When you look at longer sequences, the seven initial conditions get smaller and smaller and smaller. Or the other way to say that is basically the refined partition the cells get smaller and smaller and smaller. And it basically leads to that definition of a Markov partition. So, um, so th this is very handy. We've gone from a system over real numbers to a four-state system, and we can calculate eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and do all sorts of things, just like that. And because it's a good representation, then properties we calculate are properties of the original dynamical system. So let's go through our prototype 1D maps here, just to think this through. Um, shift map. Okay, so here's the shift map. Remember, it's uh, xn plus 1 is 2 times xn mod 1. It has these two monotone pieces. The slope is 2 everywhere. So a Markov partition for this dynamical system is to put the decision point at a half. 
Okay, so now we, we, we have criteria we're supposed to test. Right? We hypothesize this, um, call them labelless cells, heads and tails. So we can look at the iterate of the T labeled partition, which is this. This thing iterates up actually across the full interval, so it captures both PT and PH. So F of PT is the union of those two things. And across this whole thing, obviously the function is the one to one monotonic well behaved. And then same thing for the cell labeled H, which is the intent. It spans the whole thing and is monotonic. So, so there. So we verified that it is, this is a Markov partition, and now we have this two-state Markov chain over that, um, that dynamical system. Heads can go to heads, heads can go to tails, heads can go to tails, tails can go to heads. In other words, all head-tail sequences get produced. Yeah? So, I don't know, along this line of between these complete unions, so mm -hmm. like logistic math, So if you increase your resolution on your logistic map, so you can get four bins, ah. you would lose your, your, your unions. Well, you, still don't, you, you can propose a, a, a four-element partition for the logistic map. That's fine, but you still have to go back and verify these. So there are four-element partitions of the Right, they're not four uniform space. Exactly. So, so say, right. well, so you're, you're one, you're like two evenly right. spaced, say I apply my three right. instruments. Excellent. Yes. I do worse. Right. Okay. So. In, in some ways, in some ways, I, I do. Yeah. Worse. Right. No, that's that's an excellent just... question. Yeah. Well, worse. I mean, you, you should study that, but I, I think at, at, at this point, you should be highly suspicious of all the analog to digital converters you've ever bought, or the way to think about it. Maybe instead of you know buying the really expensive twenty-four bit converter, you could have bought a ten-bit converter if you could design in what the cell size it should be in the threshold. So, um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about bad partitions. I mean, first, what's good, <laughs> what we get out of it, uh, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about when, how things can go bad. And they can go really bad, which makes you, should make you really suspicious about using uniform cell measuring instruments for chaotic systems. But let's just finish up the uh, Examples here, just to kind of drive the stuff home. Okay, uh, tent map and logistic map. Again, the argument's sort of the same, even you know, uh, similar to the shift map. I'm going to put my decision point in a half of both. You know, what I'm doing here is I'm looking where the maximum is, and then that's where I put my decision point. Um, and again, you can go through f of a maps to both, f of b maps to both. Um, same thing. Uh, monotone over each one of those things, and so on. It's essentially the same argument as the shift map, which tells you a little bit about some of the information that could be thrown away. Namely, um, the shift map had two, p two monotone pieces and a positive slope. Tent map has a negative piece. Um, you have to look a little more carefully um, in, in the encoding I just mentioned, the non-monotonic uh, ordering of the, of the words that you get out tells you a little bit of that, but you have to look a little harder for some of the information. Um, and here, these things are positive negative slope. That part is going to be the same here. They have very much the same symbolic dynamics. And they're also summarized by the same two-state two Markov chain. All AD sequences can occur. So this is like the fair point process, right? So both the shift map, tent map, and logistic map, when they go all the way up to the top of the interval, they take the full interval onto itself. They're essentially fair point process. Okay, now here's a little less uh, trivial one, although a, a bit concocted. Um, I talked before uh, about the golden mean process, no consecutive zeros. Well, here's a one dimensional map that produces that as a symbolic output. Okay, so uh, well, here. Um, Mapping the interval to itself, the green is F. Um, it's like the tent map, except that I have the, uh, this is value B here, um, which is the decision point I'm going to use. That's where the maximum is. And uh, here's the 
the, the map when x is less than b. I have that linear piece with positive slope. The slope is phi. Phi is 1 plus square root of 5 over 2, which is the golden mean, hence the name. Uh, and then b is a little bit of algebra to calculate what the decision point should be to get this to fit on the interval. It's 1 over 1 plus phi. Okay. And then this is the slope region. Um, so what I'm going to do is have a, this binary partition, x less than b, it outputs b, x greater than b, it outputs capital A. But again, it's, it's easy to verify, right? f of big b maps all the way onto a, f of a maps across the whole interval, and therefore a, big A, and big B partition elements. And it's f is monotone of each one of those partition elements. So it's on our Markov chain verification. And so then we can write down what the possible states are, A and B, and then what the transition structure is. Right. A can go to itself, or to B. A can go to itself, or to B. And then B always goes to A. B always goes to A. So here's a one-dimensional dynamical system that produces that global mean binary process. This, this, this is the no consecutive Z's process, or no consecutive zeros. Let it look that way. Another example, uh, the tent map. So again, this is our bifurcation diagram, right, tent map. Now we're doing the height, a equal two, it's it's fully two onto one. And then a, a just a little bit above one, which is just above the, uh, the identity of the map. We have these tiny little bands, two bands merging to one, and we have one full band here. So let's look at this a value. This is a square root of two. And there we these two bands that merge together there. We saw the, the, the probability distribution. We right, have these two pieces. They sort of map into each other. This, this value here is that unstable period one orbit. This piece maps this piece. This piece maps this piece. So it's kind of a noisy period two process. Uh, what about a Markov partition for this? Okay. So the first thing you have to do is figure out what the boundaries of the attractor are. So, so we're looking at this invariant set. Uh, it turns out the, the upper bound of the attractor is just what the height is, right? If I, no matter where I start on the interval, I can't, after the first iterate, getting larger than this. So f of a half here is the upper bound on the attractor. And the lower bound is, is f of that again, which turns out to be that here. Right, if you think about, there's this upper bound here, and it's just a, nothing can be, no iterate can be larger than the maximum amount. Then this boundary maps that with this boundary in the next iterate. And then if you remember with the criteria for band merging, then so you have f of a half, f squared of a half, f cubed, f to the fourth of a half, and so on. They all land on here. This is a period one orbit, but it's unstable. So the iterates of a half become period one. And that is the criteria for the two bands merge. So that gives us a hint about where we should be putting these partition dividers. Um, you have to kind of scratch your head a little bit and think think about this. Um, once you get the hang of the construction, how the partition boundaries have to map into each other, not too hard in this case. So, so the proposed partition is this. So this is the attractor, and I'm going to break it into three pieces. Uh, I break it into uh, piece A that maps up to C, and a piece B that maps up to C, and a piece C partition that maps over A and B. And we can go through the, the checking we have to do. So F of C, well that maps exactly onto the union of A and B, and it's a straight map there, so it's monotone. F of B is just Maps exactly on the C, and F of A maps exactly on C. So there we go. Now, what are the what are the allowed transitions? Well, I have these three now states of the Markov chain. 
C can basically go to either of these. But if I'm in state A or B, they always go back to C. So there's just a little bit of uncertainty here. As soon as I'm in A or B, it's predictable I'm going back to C. So that's kind of period two. Every other time, I'm uncertain about what state I'm going to go to. OK, well, actually, that was it. I guess I must have gone fast. <laughs> so any questions about this? We'll, we'll do some, some more examples and talk a little bit about how things can go wrong. In particular, the, the, the Markov criteria is very strict. Right? It's, it's exact mapping of the boundaries, partitioned cell boundaries onto themselves. And that can be hard to find. So we need to relax that a bit. So next lecture, we'll talk about these generating partitions are much, much easier to, to identify. But they still have this property that long sequences identify smaller and smaller intervals of initial conditions that could produce them. Uh, OK, so that's it. Um, see you Tuesday. And if